build it and maybe Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Bugbear's uh, NCBS live session, which is like named Weekend Chat with Researchers. And this time we are back with our fifth session and uh, we have something interesting to talk to, which like most of the people are interested in, that is food. So um, yeah, uh, let's introduce ourselves first. Bugbear's NCBS, uh, we, we are part of NCBS. Uh, National Center for Biological Sciences. And this is our research outreach initiative. And we believe that anybody sitting at home can understand and learn science and research um, with just having access to internet and any kind of uh, mobile device or laptop. Now, without further ado, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nitish and with me, Ashwin, uh, we'll be hosting the session for next 60 to 70 minutes. And uh, how about like I start the, uh, this session with a small question to Ashwin. So Ashwin, when we talk about food, um, can you tell me what food you like and what food do you don't like? I love potatoes. And uh, one food, uh, even um, all the money in the world cannot tempt me to eat is karela. <laughs> Okay, so so uh, th this kind of choice that you made for food, like eating a potato and uh, not eating, not choosing karela, how did you decide? Like, is, is it based on uh, experience, some bad experience? You know, it's interesting, right? I, I've never liked karela, never liked karela, and it's uh, why the and 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 of course, some of uh, my best friends' uh, favorite food is karela. Right, and uh, we often have uh, interesting conversations over that. But I don't know; I just don't like it, right? And uh, we, it's an important open question: where where does the taste for food uh, uh, come from? Um, yeah, uh, I just don't. Yeah, for for me, karela for for taste of karela, like I developed like initially, I did not like, but I somewhat like some few recipes of karela. So Ashwin, uh, have you like wondered like how uh, animals around us choose uh, various kind of food that they eat? For example, if you could see our poster, which was published, like there, there was dung beetle eating dung, and um, um, there are the different insects which which feed on plants, and there are variety of plants which are around us. Some are poisonous, some are not poisonous, and uh, they might act different to uh, different organisms. So how like how do these insects uh, think like we like according to people uh, sorry uh, we we are like superior organism and we can think so do these insects think or uh, how how do they actually manage to choose some food? Well, if, if uh, I don't know how I'm choosing my food, leave alone insects, and I would rather like to know if. Uh, uh, science knows uh, some answers to these questions. Okay, great. So why don't you introduce like th these answers can be like a bit more, we, we, we might get a bit of light uh, to these answers. And uh, why don't you introduce our audience uh, to our guest uh, who will be the session star. So uh, we have uh, with us uh, Deepa Gashi. She's um, um, again the faculty at uh, NCPS. She's an evolutionary biologist and works on different organisms. She works on bacteria on one side and uh, uh, insects on the other. Um, and uh, she, uh, in her uh, postdoc, she worked uh, uh, largely on uh, bacterial evolutionary uh, biology, trying to answer questions on how the genetic code might have uh, evolved. And now she has a, um, a large program looking at uh, diverse aspects of uh, bacterial and uh, insect evolution and how bacteria and insects talk to uh, each other as well. So over to you, Deepa. Thank you for okay. uh, uh, joining us. Yeah, uh, I'm excited to be here and to tell you a bit about uh, what I have learned and what, you know, what more we really should learn about how animals make choices about food and, and, and what is this obsession with food, right? So 
Um, as Nitish mentioned, you know, food is something favorite. Uh, all of us uh, enjoy food of different kinds. And um, we'll, we'll sort of, I think, uh, talk about many different aspects of thinking about food choice and not just food choice, but more what do we eat and why do we eat it effectively, right? And not we as in humans, I'm actually going to move away from humans largely. Um, and I'd like to quickly start off. Uh, so maybe I'll start sharing my screen. Um, just to show you some pictures and start uh, uh, thinking about how we can begin to ask these kinds of questions. So yeah, before, see before we start, uh, I will just like to uh, ask our audience to use the live chat option uh, rigorously to ask any question that you think and that, that is relevant or irrelevant according to you. Uh, our uh, guest will be happy to answer. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so so we're going to talk about food choice and animals today. And I thought I'd start off by just reminding people of the of the very central um, uh, sort of role that food plays in our lives, but also in the lives of all organisms. Right? Effectively, you need to get energy and you need to acquire nutrition of different kinds, um, and and we eat to to basically um, to to acquire these key resources that we need to build uh, our our body to grow. Uh, to be able to um, do all the things that we enjoy doing. And animals, of course, also need to do um, to eat in order to get more food to eat, right? So that's sort of the cycle in which um, most animals are running to say, okay, well, um, to be able to breed and reproduce and live, uh, we need to eat. And then what do we do when we eat? Well, we eat some more or, or find some more food. So that's kind of the short-term um, effects of diet, which are very obvious to us. You know, we know that um, uh, having a good diet is important for proper maintenance of our body. It's important for reproduction, but there are also these very long-term effects of diet, which are very, very important. And, and these, are, um, these are typically studied in the context of evolutionary biology. We want to ask, uh, how has diet shaped animals or plants or their physiology, their behavior? And there are very, very interesting and fascinating examples of these long-term effects of, of dietary changes when uh, animal species or particular groups of uh, or populations of a species of an animal can shift to using a different diet uh, over evolutionary time. And that shift then has major other repercussions, right? So I'll start off by showing you some uh, pictures as examples uh, of what's going on. So. So here is one example from uh, different parts of Africa. So there are these different lakes in Africa and, and these different lakes harbor some of the highest diversity of these group of fishes called cichlid fish. And you see here examples highlighting three different lakes, um, the crater lakes in Africa, where you see this huge diversity of fish, right? They're different colors, um, they have different patterns on them. And this is just a small sampling of the diversity that you actually see in these lakes. So people have studied these fish in these lakes for a long time, trying to understand why do we have this huge concentration in single lakes, in small, relatively small single lakes? How can we have this enormous number of different species that all look very different and do very different things? Um, and so one thing you'll notice, if you look closely at the mouth parts of these different fish, so the bright red one on in the in the top uh, part, I don't know if my pointer works. Can you see my pointer? Yeah. Okay, great. So this fish here uh, has a mouth part which suggests that it's it's um, it's sort of feeding something from top like this, right? Here's another fish in contrast, which has mouth parts which suggest it sort of scrapes the bottom, the sediments in the um, in the uh, lake, and is sort of taking things out of that. You also have a very fleshy lipped fish here, like this one. And uh, this one sort of scrapes things off of rocks, algae or other things going off of rocks and so on in, inside the lake again. So you see there are very different shapes and morphologies and body, mouth parts that have evolved in these different lineages um, or different species of fish. And, and this, as you can imagine, has to do with what they eat, right? So in order to be able to efficiently use um, you know, the, the kind of diet that they seem specialized on, uh, they have over time evolved um, all these different kinds of mouth parts, right? 
so which is very, very fascinating. And so what we know from a lot of scientists working for many, many years on these different fish is that part of the reason why there is such a huge number of different fish species in this lake is because they, uh, there has been um, uh, well, what we call natural selection um, in the process of which these different fish have uh, used or evolved to use different kinds of foods, right? And partly because they use different kinds of food, then their structure changed, their body shape changed, uh, their habits changed, their behavior changed, where they hang out in the water changed. And then in association with this, there were a whole bunch of other changes that happened with their color that have to do with their ability to find mates in particular parts of the water because it's darker in the deeper side in, uh, parts of the water in the lake. So it's better to have certain colors which are better absorbed even at that depth in the water and better reflected and so on and so forth, right? So, so diet has played a, a really large role in, these, in the development of these fish. And this is just one example. There are many other um, fish species which have also, we think, uh, diversified because of their diets. Um, here's another example from birds. So these are honey creepers. Uh, found in Africa, and they have a really large differentiation of the kind of beak morphology they have, right? And you'll notice this. So, for example, here are insectivores, um, which have uh, sort of shorter, very pointy beaks. There are also insectivores, but they specialize on getting insects out of bark. So many of them have these kinds of hooks with which they can extract insects from tree bark. There are frugivores, so they eat fruits. Uh, or, and seed eaters, and they tend to have thicker, shorter bills because then that's easier for them to grab and extract uh, parts of fruits or, or seeds and dry them out of uh, things like pine cones, for example. Um, nectarivores are uh, birds that are drinking nectar from flowers. And so you can see that their beaks are in some cases long and sort of curved to be able to access the nectar in different flowers from which they are drinking the nectar. And then there are some which are generalists, which sort of don't seem to um, specialize on any one of these diets, but are able to sort of switch across different diets depending on the opportunity. So again, you can see that this has led to enormous differentiation in the tools that we use to, uh, that these animals use to get their diet and get their food, right? Um, and so it's really, really remarkable and interesting that something as simple as small changes in, in what you eat can lead over really long term uh, to really large differences in what species look like and how they behave. So uh, Deepa, yeah. so I have a question. So here we've uh, talked about diet influencing some aspects of um, um, uh, the, uh, an animal's evolution. Do we have do we know to what extent uh, uh, food tastes may be genetically mm -hmm. determined? Is there mm -hmm. research on, on that? Food taste meaning our reaction like, or our perception? Yeah, like for example, me liking a potato and not uh, a karela and somebody else. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 is, is there any genetic uh, uh, determinant to this? Because obviously we develop tastes over over. Uh, time that's always there but is there any component yeah. that we know so i i will confess that i don't know that particular literature very very well because um, a lot of olfaction is involved in it and taste receptors so so basically we we smell the food as well right when we eat it and so i'm not very well versed in the work then on that aspect but what i do know is actually there is a lot of influence of experience and uh, other factors that play a role in what a particular individual chooses to do when it, it has an option, you know, in front of it. Is there a buffet in front of it? You know, clearly Ashwin is not going to eat, go for the karela. But I have actually over time learned to enjoy karela. I did not used to like it when I was small. And, and I think that's a common phenomenon. For many, many children, they don't like very bitter tastes or they don't like very sour tastes. And then over time, that sort of changes. And so it's clear that there are many other factors that play a role in our likes and dislikes. Um, and, and especially for humans, because our behavior and our liking and disliking is so complex. Um, but for many animals also, people have been exploring this question of, you know, what do they choose to eat if there is a buffet put out in front of them? Um, and, and the answers, again, are, are 
very, very varied and very, very different. Um, I think people do know that depending on some of the, um, I guess the receptors in our mouth or in our nose, or in the case of many animals, other parts of their body with which they use to taste the food they're in. So some animals will have receptors on their legs, for example, or um, females which are uh, of insects, which are going to lay eggs, let's say on a particular plant, uh, it's like butterfly females. Uh, people have found recently that their abdomen, which is um, the, the back part of their body, has um, receptors. And those receptors are basically their proteins, right? So these receptors are able to detect um, chemicals that a plant emits. And the female will go and sort of poke her abdomen around and touch different parts of a leaf. And that is, it's thought that that is how she's getting information on, is this a suitable leaf for my, uh, for my offspring, for my larvae to grow and eat, or is this not a good idea? And so, um, so, so we taste in many different ways. And so if these receptors then, uh, the olfactory receptors are shut down because of genetic mutations and so on, then this animal uh, will not be able to uh, make these choices of resources or diets very well. And so it suggests that there is certainly some component of, um, some genetic component of what we do in terms of food choice. Um, another example I can think of is mosquitoes. So uh, mosquitoes, there was a very nice uh, series of work done, well, actually one study which was really, really important. Um, then a few years ago, uh, trying to ask in Africa, uh, there are a bunch of mosquito species which have been domesticated and now sort of, well, not domesticated intentionally, but they like human blood and they like feeding on human blood much more. Whereas other mosquitoes um, that are closely related are much more interested in uh, feeding on wild animals that you find in the forest. So these are mostly forest dwelling mosquitoes. And we know for sure that uh, uh, ones that bite humans, the domesticated ones, uh, evolved from a lineage that, that originally lived in the forest. And so they mapped, um, these researchers again mapped how this transition or this shift happened and again, they find that there is uh, there was a mutation set of mutations in the uh, the olfactory receptor, uh, which determine the sense of smell of these mosquitoes, and that would allow them to be more or less attracted towards humans, and that is why these domestic domesticated mosquitoes now prefer to uh, bite humans instead of other wild animals. And so there certainly is a genetic component, but whether that is generally the case and how much the effect of that genetic component can be overridden by other experiences in the life in your life or by other factors how many competitors there are all of that is not as well understood yet so in many cases the answer of is there a genetic component has been many times answer, asked in very uh, so the question has been asked in very different sets of animals compared to the question of uh, you know how many and which factors influence the behavioral choices that um, animals make. So yeah, that was a very long answer to your question, but I hope I answered it. Yeah, so Deepa, I have one question. Um, like, so you mentioned about when, when you were talking about these fishes and these birds, you mentioned the word like uh, natural selection. So could you explain more what are the factors which are, um, which are driving this kind of uh, uh, fe like you fe the distinct feature in different fishes and these birds, like mm -hmm. to audience who are not familiar with this term? Yeah, yeah. So, so the process of natural selection is effectively, um, in a nutshell, um, explaining how, um, how if there is a lot of variation in a population, only some of it eventually survives over time, right? Eventually is observed over time. So, uh, so you may start with a population and so variation is always generated, right? And we know that now that's generated by mutations that occur. So all of us have many, many mutations in our, in, our, in our DNA compared to our parents' DNA, right, from which um, uh, we came. And, and these, this process of mutations, is, it's happening everywhere all the time. So all of us have lots of mutations. Our skin cells have mutations, especially because they get exposed to sunlight and UV radiation in the sunlight and so on. So mutation is an inevitable process. But um, most of these mutations, we think, uh, will, will, um, will eventually be thrown out by what we call this process of natural selection. And effectively, that means that if any of these mutations impact our ability to survive or reproduce, 
then those mutations will eventually be lost from the population because they're not allowing us to be competitive enough, right? So, um, so basically, um, let's say a bird is eating seeds to start with, and, um, and in, in a particular area, this bird species eats a particular kind of seed, and let's say there's a, a drought that happens, and, and during that drought, these plants that were producing these seeds the bird was eating are dying. And now the bird is also going to die because it, it, you know, there's not the food for it, perhaps. So let's imagine now there are some birds in this population of birds, which are able to eat some other seed which is around, right? Which was not preferred earlier, which was not used by this bird earlier. Maybe it's a bit smaller, or maybe it's a little bit larger. And so it's harder for them to eat this fruit, uh, this new seed. Um, but some of them, because of these variations that exist because of mutations, some of these birds in this population happen to have beaks that were just a little bit larger or just a little bit smaller. And as a result, they're actually pretty good at maybe eating this seed, right? The different seed, which is actually available in plenty. Now, what's going to happen is if this drought continues, the birds that are successful at getting these smaller or larger seeds are going to end up producing more babies. And over time in this population, you'll find that the original uh, uh, kind of variant of the bird with that particular beak size, which was suitable for the original food, is now perhaps becoming rare in the population because its food is not available. And so um, over time, this, this is the process of natural selection where if you're not reproducing or surviving at a rate that is as good as the best in your population in that particular environment, then your genes or your mutations will be slowly lost from the population over time. So as a process, this is the process of natural selection. And, and as a result, what we end up having is these uh, almost cycles, right, of where you'll have more variation in the population. Then it will reduce if there's a strong selecting event that occurs like drought or a big storm comes and all the birds which are not able to make a nice nest or, um, or find food uh, in a sheltered area may be blown off by the wind, which is very strong and they will not survive or their offspring will no longer be found. Um, and and that, that is effectively what we mean by natural selection, leading to diversification over time of uh, phenotypes which may have to do with diet. And this is exactly the process by which, uh, if you've heard of Darwin's finches, which are uh, finches um, found on the Galapagos Island, uh, these are the finches that are famously, were famously described by Darwin um, when he, and he used them as an example to uh, understand diversification and new species arising uh, in, in island populations. And uh, later on, um, a, a group of researchers have studied these same finches uh, for many, many uh, decades, and they have uncovered basically the series of events that I just described as an example of how natural selection can lead to uh, evolution of very different beak sizes, starting from the same population of a bird. So uh, Deepa, while on the, so the subject of evolution and islands, if, uh, with the, these lakes, are these mm -hmm. uh, species of uh, fishes unique to the particular lake or is there uh, movement across uh, lakes? Yeah, yeah. So there is, I think there, as far as I remember, there is not much movement across these large lakes shown in this picture here. Um, but some of them are connected, I think, through small streams or rivers to other smaller lakes nearby. But the degree of endemism in these lakes is very high. Uh, so by endemism, we mean species which are not found anywhere else apart from that one area. And so I think these uh, are amongst the very, very high levels of endemism found in the world for fish. Um, so yeah, so I know that there are some connections, but I don't think uh, they're largely isolated. Is uh, diet considered one of the main drivers of uh, uh, speciation within these? Uh, one of the drivers. Species? Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is so it, we, it's known, it's for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's known for certain though that sexual selection, which is selection acting uh, on mate choice, has also played a very large role in the speciation in these fish. So, um, so probably some combination of all of these factors. 
Um, and I'll talk about some other factors also uh, in future, like you know what what are the factors that allow diet shifts to occur uh, repeatedly or or rapidly. Um, yeah. Okay. So I should also encourage the audience to ask questions. We haven't had any so far, which is uh, surprising given what we've uh, seen so far. So please ask away. Okay. All right. Um, maybe I can go ahead a little bit and then we can come back to this if people have questions about uh, about these topics. Okay, so I wanted to next dazzle you with some beetles from India um, to, to, to sort of just show you the diversity of different beetles that we have here, right? So this is, these are all pictures that I took in, in one trip in Arunachal Pradesh, in a small area of Arunachal Pradesh. Um, like very, very small area, really. And look at the crazy amount of diversity we have, right? So these are all, most of these beetles, actually all of these beetles are plant feeding beetles, right? Um, they eat some part of plant or the other. And you can see they have enormously different shapes and sizes and colors um, and, and patterns on their body. And this variation you see in color and diversity you see in color is just, um, you know, one of the traits in which they differ. They also differ in what chemical compounds they're able to digest, which kinds of plants they're, um, they're able to eat, and uh, how many different kinds of plant species they can eat, and so on and so forth, what part of the plant they eat. And so there's very, very interesting work uh, done in the last few years that has helped us understand better why beetles have so many species. So I'm sure many of you have heard that uh, beetles are uh, the sort of single group of animals that is most diverse on, on this planet. And so it's estimated that like a really, really large fraction of all animal species we know so far are beetles, particularly insects, within insects for sure. And half of all, uh, all the beetle species that we know of, um, these authors of uh, a study that was published a few years ago, um, they suggested that about half of that diversity of beetles is arising because of their uh, diversification associated with eating different plants. And so this was a great innovation uh, in, in old lineages of these beetles to be able to use plants and eat plants, right? And what is even more fascinating is that um, many of the enzymes that are required to degrade plant material, like cellulose, which is the outer layer of plant cell walls, right? Um, you can't degrade cellulose. Most animals are unable to do that. We don't have the enzymes necessary to degrade it. But many of these beetles which eat plants have acquired the genes necessary to uh, digest cellulose to produce enzymes from bacteria or fungi through what's called horizontal gene transfer. So because these genes somehow jumped from bacteria or fungi, which typically do degrade cellulose, many of which do degrade cellulose, um, once the beetle lineages acquired these, then the whole buffet was open for them, right? They could eat many different plant species, they could consume it, acquire nutrition from these different plant species. Um, and so, so it's really, really fascinating how, uh, how these different species can evolve to consume different niches and different plants. Um, and, and as a result, sort of find a nice space where they, they are their boss, right? And they can eat as much as they want, uh, and nobody else is really uh, competing with them for that for that niche. So Deepa, over here, um, see, uh, since beetles feed on plants and plants are also a uh, um, part of like living system, a huge part of uh, living uh, di diversity, biodiversity, and natural selection might will also be acting on them. So how, how does uh, uh, like the natural selection, which is acting on plants, and natural selection, uh, which is acting on beetles, is like um, um, adapted, co adapted together, or maybe like, uh, uh, like co-evolved. Co-evolved, yeah. Yeah, co yeah. So there's very fascinating, um, um, yeah, stories to be told here, and and maybe I'll just mention one or two as an example. So there are some. So of course, many many plants produce toxins, or they produce. Uh, you know, nasty thorns or sticky hair um, and other things to deter herbivores, right? Like beetles uh, or other insects from chewing on their paths. 
and and many times plants produce like super duper chemicals to uh, to prevent which will make the herbivore sick and therefore the the herbivore will no longer come and try and eat this plant right so but of course there are lots of insect species which do eat very very toxic plants right um and so maybe an example is um the castor plant which many of you may have uh, seen which is a weed that grows commonly in india uh, and it produces the seed of castor plant are amongst the most potent toxins that we know of and so it's chock full of toxins and there are yet some insects that eat different parts of this plant um similarly if you've seen milkweeds um callotropis so this is a plant which is i think it's called rui uh in in many uh, parts of india so it's a again a weed plant weedy plant that grows it 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 has these large leaves um sort of light colored and they have a fuzz on top and if you break that leaf there's this milky white latex uh, sticky stuff that comes out right and if as a kid you've played around and you've gotten it on your hand sometimes you'll get a rash or it is very hard to remove if one sits on your hand so this latex this milky white stuff is um uh, is basically toxic and it's the plant produces it to you know prevent others from eating it and there are so many insects which actually have evolved to be able to deal with this toxin and one of the ways in which they have evolved to deal with this toxin some insects um so the toxin this particular toxin what it does is it it prevents the heart from functioning normally uh by by um basically blocking the pumps in our cells that uh exchange different ions across right and so if you if your cells don't do that properly you will end up dying basically they don't function and then ultimately in this case the insect's heart will stop and it will not be able to function right it will it will be dead um and so uh, so so the toxin uh messes with the sodium potassium pumps uh which all um, all animals have in their cells and what the insects have evolved the ones that do feed on these plants on these milkweeds um they have basically changed the protein which this toxin binds to and blocks and there's a small set of mutations that have occurred and as a result the toxin is no longer able to bind what's even more fascinating is some of these insects have evolved the ability to be able to take these toxins and put them in different parts of their body to protect themselves against their predators so there are a bunch of butterflies for example which can feed on these plants and then if you look at the caterpillars of these butterflies they're brightly colored and they are basically advertising to birds and other predators i am full of toxin which i got from this plant and i have stored away and it doesn't affect me this toxin uh, but if you eat me you're going to want to vomit and you're going to be very sick so learn my pattern and avoid me right so there are these very very interesting sets of um sort of back and forth arms races that have evolved because everybody is effectively under selection to to be better and to be uh you know to be more well defended to be faster to be reproducing more to be surviving more as the case may be in the environment so so yes there is fascinating examples of uh, these kinds of back and forth in evolutionary time Okay, hey, so here Harini has a question here. So she asks, uh, "How do we know what mosquitoes eat when their mouths are so small?" So it's a methods mm-hmm. question. So how do we study, I guess, um, insects and their diets? Um, yeah, so you can watch them very, very carefully. So even if they're small, uh, sometimes you can use a microscope if you need. And um, what you can also do is you can. open the insect up like you can dissect it again you might need a microscope or a or a magnifying glass depending on how big is the insect and you can open it up and you can see what's inside right and in the case of a female mosquito uh well first it bites you so you're pretty sure that it's biting me uh for doing for getting something out of me and then if you squish it you i'm sure you've squished a mosquito by now um you'll see that you know blood comes out right blood that looks a lot like human blood and so people have observed that um uh and these are the kinds of observations that will help us understand what an insect eats in some cases which are more complicated so let's say there's some insect about, about which we really don't know much right mosquitoes are actually relatively easy because you know we know about them quite a lot and they're around us in plenty of numbers so it's very easy to study them in some sense 
But there are lots of other insects which, you know, they are very rare or nobody da- knows much about them. Then, then that question becomes even more interesting, right? Like how do you figure out what this insect eats? You don't even know anything about it, ins- about this insect. So there are other methods you can use to, uh, chemical methods to probe what is inside the belly of the insect. And so you could try, um, yeah, well, let me just stop at that, chemical methods to try and figure out uh, what is inside an insect's belly. And, and that can actually give you a lot of information. Uh, on that uh, topic, it was, I think, I, yeah, if I remember right, there was even a recent study who where people sort of looked at uh, the diet of these uh, in, from ancient, even older skeletons and so on, right? It was, mm. uh, was it two years ago. It was, uh, from the from the remains of the skeletons, they sort of made some prediction on what kinds of food um, that uh, these individuals are. Uh, yeah. Eating. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe based on nitrogen isotope ratio. Yeah. So I was going to say this, but I, yeah, I wasn't sure if Harini, you might have to explain to her stable isotopes. But but basically, you can use uh, different forms of uh, the same um, the same element to uh, to determine how what proportion of different diets we uh, the animal has eaten. So I'm guessing what you're referring to is about nitrogen isotopes. So Carnivores will typically have a different ratio of N15 and N14, which are the two forms of nitrogen, um, compared to uh, herbivores or vegetarian uh, animals. And so you can use that. So the higher up you go in the food chain, uh, carnivores end up concentrating the N15 in, in their bodies. And so I'm guessing that's what they used in this study that you are mentioning to at least understand if they were likely to be carnivores or herbivores. Um, Another way you can do this is different kinds of plants have different uh, concentrations of carbon-13 versus carbon-14, depending on the photosynthetic system they have. And so actually in my PhD, I could use this uh, fact to ask um, when I gave uh, beetles in my lab the choice of eating wheat versus corn. Turns out because wheat and corn have different photosynthetic enzymes that they use, uh, they end up concentrating. So the wheat and corn itself has different proportions of C13 and C14 carbon. Um, am I saying C14? No, C12 and C13, sorry. And, um, and, and if I now crush the beetle and analyze all the carbon in its body, I can tell whether uh, a, you know this particular beetle ate more corn or ate more wheat. And then I could ask questions about you know, how is that diet shift happening? Because the beetles are well adapted to wheat and I force them to use corn. How are they using it? Are they using it? Uh, And so on. So these kinds of questions can be asked um, based on these chemical methods as well. Because my beetles also very hard to observe them eating because they're very small as Harini says and and they go inside the flower. And so then I can't see them. So it's, uh, you have to use other methods then. Okay, so we have some questions coming thick and fast. One again from Harini and one from Shweta Hegde. Uh, they're kind of similar. So Shweta asks, how does a particular species of beetle recognize which plant they need to feed on? Do they rely on chemical cues? And Harini asks, how again, how do animals sense what uh, uh, they should eat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a good question. And the answer actually varies a lot. So we don't know the exact answer to most species, you know, that we know of. But in some species where we have been able to study this, I mean, I'm, by, by we, my, I mean, researchers in general, um, we do know that they use uh, typically a, a mixture of olfaction. So they use smell. Um, and smell and taste are often um at the, at, the, at the level of which proteins are involved and, and how they're used, they're kind of similar. And so for many insects, um, the receptors uh, that they use to what we, what we call taste and what we call smell are actually very closely related. And so they're there on different body parts, as I mentioned earlier. Um, unlike our case where our receptors are primarily the smell receptors and the taste receptors are in our uh, nose and our mouth primarily but that's not the case for um, many other animals. So, um, so they use these two clues. Um, they can actually sort of touch their uh, belly or touch their parts of their mouth 
to the food that is that they're considering and then use the information they get from that, the chemical information they get from that to make a decision whether they should or should not eat it. Um, other cases, many other animals also use visual cues. So uh, the color, for example, of a flower uh, or patterns on a flower will often be part of what guides a pollinator to go there and find nectar or find pollen uh, to be consumed. So, um, so typically a mix of cues is, uh, are used and people know that in some insects, um, different kinds of cues are used at different distance from the food, right? So maybe a little bit farther away from the food, one kind of smell may be used to orient uh, the, the flying insect towards a particular area. Then maybe slightly closer to, uh, closer to the flower, a slightly different set of olfactory cues might be used, different smell is used. And then once it goes much closer, it might use taste receptors, uh, color, and so on to choose. So, um, so usually a mix of different cues are used. Great. Uh, so uh, Deepa, like are uh, these, um, um, the animals that we have discussed about, uh, beetles, birds, and uh, other, other organisms like fishes. So uh, are these quite opportunistic in nature or uh, they, they are like completely or like or reliant, like or they, are these obligate um, eaters? Or, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's or actually wide variation in that as well. So there are some species that we know to be very, very special, like specialized in what they eat, right? They will only eat this one plant or this one seed and if they don't get that, they will die. You know, they will not be able to eat anything else. But most, um, but in most cases, um, species are able to use at least something slightly related or similar to uh, the food that they typically eat, right? So, so many species are very, very generalist where they will eat, for example, any kind of grain or they will eat any kind of nectar, drink any kind of nectar and so on. But, uh, but again, the, the, it's a wide, wide spectrum. And then in terms of uh, other animals, there are many, many animals who will eat whatever they can find, right? Whatever they can catch. Um, and, and that sort of more or less meets their requirements for nutrition. Um, and so there's a huge role of opportunity and availability uh, in terms of deciding what a particular animal is going to end up eating in its lifetime or in a particular situation. So I'd like to show you an example um, next year. So I'm sorry, the video quality is going to be a little bit bad because this is many years ago I took these videos. Um, so uh, we were going in uh, Yellowstone Park in the US and we noticed that there were patches on the road uh, where there would be these dead chipmunks, right? So chipmunks are like squirrels. Um, and, and we felt a bit sad that they're all getting squished by cars in this national park. Um, and you're wondering though why they're in patches, right? There'll be a bunch of them here, then we go a little bit ahead and on the road, in the middle of the road, there'll be more dead animals. Like, why are they in patches? And so we stopped and watched them for some time and then we got our answer, right? So I'm gonna play you some videos which show what happens. So that's your chipmunk and it's calling. And there are its dead brothers or sisters or somebody. Okay, and then to my horror, it was eating, right? It was eating the, it's, it's other chipmunks. So the point of showing this is to say that many, many, many animals are very opportunistic. So most cases, are chipmunks going to eat, you know, dead relatives? Probably not. Uh, or other dead small animals? Probably not, or maybe they do. Uh, but most times we think of squirrels as eating nuts and seeds and so on, right? But they can eat other things and they do it because ulti ultimately this is nutrition. And so there are many other uh, animals which do something similar where, um, you know, in, in, in situations where other food is not available, they will eat something else which they can manage to catch and survive on. So I hope that was not too gory. Oh, it was interesting to me. <laughs> Yeah. 
So we have actually a couple of questions here. It again goes uh -huh. um, one of these goes back to um, developing tastes. So, mm -hmm. to what extent do animals uh, learn about diet and taste and so on from from parents? And how does this uh, happen? This question is from Mohammed Suleiman, and he mm -hmm. also asks um, a question. I don't know if you know this. Uh, how long does it take for a mosquito to digest human blood? Does it digest what? Uh, what does that even involve? So, uh, yeah. So yeah. These are, yeah. So sorry, I I remember reading about the time taken to digest mosquito uh, for mosquitoes to digest blood meal, but I forgot what it is. Uh, yeah, I have completely forgotten. So I don't even remember if it's on the order of days or hours or or what. Um, but I think they don't need too many blood meals to be able to lay eggs. So I think a single solid blood meal will be enough for a female for for quite some time. Is my like if I if I remember correctly. Um, and then going back to whether we learn taste and so on from our parents. So I'll actually talk a little bit about previous experience um, and how that guides the choices of food that animals might make uh, and tell you about some experiments that we had done. Um, but, but it's absolutely true that, um, actually, let me show you this video because uh, maybe this, this will bring us to, the, to, to thinking of that, uh, that question a bit more. So this is from Bharatpur, uh, where I had gone a few years ago. And Bharatpur is a bird sanctuary in, in Northern India. And it's a really beautiful place and a remarkable place with a lot of birds that are migrating birds from uh, you know, north of India and parts of Europe, parts of Russia. They'll come and they'll overwinter here where it's a bit warmer for them. And some of them breed there, right? So what you're going to see is a video of uh, what's called a heronry, where there are a few species of these birds that are nesting and there are there's a huge racket being made because all the birds are there are chicks and they're all begging for food from their parents and they're all making constantly all these noises that are basically like give me food give me food give me food okay so you see that and uh, and you see this parent stork which is uh, in the center of this video which comes in and it feeds the birds uh, its chicks right so let's watch and then i'll explain a little bit more about what's going on Okay, so I don't know if people were able to see this properly, but the way this feeding happens in this case is the bird regurgitates. Okay, so the parent has gone out, it can fly really well, of course, and it goes and collects fish from the water nearby, brings it back, and then it throws up. Um, and the chicks who are not able to fly yet are basically eating what the parent has brought back from their, from their, from their mouth, right? And, and that is fascinating because then there's no choice, right? That the chicks don't have any choice about what they get to eat. They get to eat whatever the parent caught and whatever fish the, their mother or father has brought back for them. And so this is a painted stalk and you see similar behavior in some other birds as well. Um, and so at least at this stage, the concept of choice doesn't really exist for, uh, for the babies that depend entirely on their parents for bringing food for them. And maybe some of you have seen similarly other birds or animals bring food for their babies. Um, and at that stage, it seems like choice is not a thing. What about later? What happens, right? Like, do we learn from our parents? So you certainly, um, again, maybe some of you have seen uh, videos which you can find online about, um, about carnivores or predatory species teaching their babies how to hunt, you know, and so on. Um, and there again, uh, perhaps some aspect of would you choose this or not, or that depends on what the parent shows them. Or, but I think in many cases, 
it probably depends much more on what is available for these big carnivores and predators, at least like tigers or leopards and so on. It depends more on what they can manage to catch and then they will catch whatever they can subdue. But at uh, sort of lower trophic levels where we're thinking of in the food chain, where we're thinking of animals like think of grazing cows or goats, um, how do they choose, you know, do they want to eat this kind of grass or is that kind of uh, plant all right to eat or not? Um, I don't know actually exactly how these preferences arise in those animals. So I don't know the, the scientific literature for that. What I can tell you is a little bit about insect preferences and how they seem to come about. Um, and so, yeah, so, so Ashwin, should we take more questions now or should I go to the next? Well, so uh, I can maybe ask this one. So probably this again, Harini, she's asking something more random, but I will sort of uh, uh, rephrase it in the present context. So does uh, the food that animals eat contribute to their color? Mm. In some cases, yes. Um, so there's an interesting example of, well, well, yes, actually, no, absolutely. Uh, what am I thinking? Yes, for birds, uh, for some of these water birds, like these painted stalks of flamingos, right? So flamingos are filter feeders. They, I think everybody has seen a picture of flamingos. Everybody's familiar with flamingos. So they're sort of doing this with their beaks, right, in the water. So what they're doing is they're filtering out the very, very small plankton that live in the water. And, and they eat that, right, from their beaks. Um, and that plankton is actually what gives them their color. Okay. Similarly, if you think of shrimp, uh, which you, which you, some of us eat, um, they're also colored with these bright pink and orange colors, right? And they also have to acquire them from the food that they eat. And, and those pigments, uh, those color pigments are important for shrimp, uh, shrimp's value. So many times if shrimp are cultivated in like a, like a farm, uh, uh, an aquatic farm, if you don't give them the right kind of food because they acquire the pigments from the food, they will not get that color, okay? So they can't use it to deposit in the parts of their body where that color has to show up. So, so yes, there are great examples of uh, animal color coming from the food. Um, in, yeah. So this is cool. So what, are they actually eating the pigments or is this some kind of a precursor that they sort of uh, need to process and then make a pigment? Um, no, I think it's the actual color that the, the pigments, that pigments are ready made uh, in the wow. food they're eating. And they're basically depositing them, you know, in the right places. For the birds, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm quite certain for the shrimp uh, that they acquire the pigment directly. I think the birds also do that. Uh, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure about that. There might be some more chemical processing that's required before the color becomes what it is uh, in the bird. So here is a question coming in uh, from my mom. Okay, so she says, um, she, I've seen cows and goats keeping off certain plants mm -hmm. and by the same count, a sick cat or dog looking for certain plants. Mm -hmm. Do we have any explanation for these? Uh, yeah, so uh, again, I'm not very familiar with the scientific understanding of these kinds of choices that the animals are making. But I do know that, that I mean, they're, they're certainly, you know, very smart and they know what is poisonous. And I do, what I don't know is how, of, how much of this kind of behavior is learned by, you know, once trying a bad plant, a toxic plant, having a reaction and then deciding, okay, I should never eat that plant again, versus how much of it, uh, of this behavior is in it, in the sense, uh, even a small calf will know not to eat a particular plant. Um, and there are some clear predictions from evolutionary theory about, you know, or ecological theory, which of these uh, should evolve under what conditions. So if it's a very, very toxic plant, which is going to kill you, the, the chances that you're going to uh, be able to, uh, you know, detect that plant and avoid it uh, at birth itself, from birth itself, it should be very high because otherwise, you know, any lineage that doesn't do that is going to be gone through the process of natural selection. Um, but most plants which are toxic tend to be not lethal um, in the sort of dose that they that the animal eats them because then the animal learns and then stays away. 
but I don't know specifically for cows uh, and cats and dogs and so on, how much of that behavior that we observe is, is learned. Um, I'll have to look it up. So let's uh, go towards the end of the uh, session. Like um, since mm -hmm. um, this uh, session are called Weekend Chat with Researchers and uh, we, we uh, try to investigate these things. And so how, how, uh, how do we uh, like find out these uh, choices, food choices, especially in laboratory environment? And mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe you can talk about uh, your work that you're doing. Yeah. So, so this is an example. Uh, I'm gonna just quickly tell you a, a brief outline of some of some of the interesting stuff that we found. So, this is the red flower beetle. It's a small pest species which eats different kinds of cereal grain uh, flour, and um, it is most well adapted to wheat flour. Uh, so, wheat is just a cartoon of different grains. So, this is wheat, and if you make, uh, if you've had wheat flour in your home. Uh, maybe if it stays for quite some time, you will have noticed these little red-brown insects uh, walking around and their eggs and larvae, they're all in the same flower and they develop, right? So we were curious to ask, um, in India, we, we, we store many kinds of grain and flour and we use many kinds of grain and flour. And um, we noticed that these beetles are typically found on wheat flour, but not on other flowers like sorghum, which is jawar or rice, or finger millet, which is ragi, right? And so we were curious to know why not? Why do we not find them uh, eating these different available flowers, which are, you know, everybody has around and there are big warehouses where these flowers are stored. So we were trying to do some experiments to understand this. And um, we thought maybe food choice has something to do with this. Maybe they don't infest those other flowers so much because they don't like the taste or they can't eat it very well. So we did some experiments. So we took larvae and if we just give larvae which have grown up in wheat flour a choice between wheat and ragi or wheat and jawar or wheat and rice, most of them will end up choosing wheat. Okay. But what, what now what's interesting is we thought, well, maybe we should look at the effect of experience, right? So what if the larvae at an early stage had some experience with one of these new flowers? Would that change their choice? And interestingly, it does. So we took eggs that the beetles had laid in wheat and we allowed them to experience either ragi uh, or jawar as they grew up, right? And now when they became larvae, if we choose, ask them, you know, we give you a choice of wheat and the new resource, which you experienced as a baby, as you were growing up, we find that they're more likely to choose the new resource that we gave them, right? So this experiment very clearly showed that your experience early in your life can really change what you end up choosing later in your life uh, as a food source. And so this was a simple set of experiments and we're now doing more work to try and understand this better, try and understand how does a female decide to lay eggs in one or another flower. And so this seems to explain part of it. But then of course, another part of it is also, well, maybe they don't use ragi flower because they don't survive very well in ragi flour. So is that what's happening? So to try and understand that and to ask how they uh, overcome these, uh, these problems they may face, we are now doing uh, long-term experiments where we've taken uh, beetles from different parts of India and we have allowed them to evolve either on wheat or on corn or on finger millet, which is ragi, for many, 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 many generations in the lab. So now they've been evolving for uh, five or six years in the lab. Um, and we're hoping now to start finding out, well, uh, they've all gotten better by the way, right? So they've, the, all the populations were initially um, not doing very well on finger millet and corn. So they were not producing as many offspring, as many babies, and they were not surviving as well. But now over five or six years of evolution in the laboratory on these different resources, they're doing much better. Right? And so we would love to now ask, uh, ask whether that choice experiment that we did earlier with the larvae, for larvae who, who have now evolved, whose, gen, you know, whose lineage has evolved on ragi for a long time, do those larvae inherently prefer to eat ragi? Uh, or do they still prefer to eat wheat and will only use ragi if, not, if there's no other choice? So these are the kinds of experiments that we're doing in the lab to try and figure out these answers. And um, finally, I guess I'll end with 
just a quick note and uh, show you some different kinds of pretty pictures to say that um, there are many, many cases where animals cannot digest the food that they eat, right? So that may also govern their food choice. Like if you can't digest it, you're not acquiring the nutrition you need, then you are not going to be uh, consuming that particular food. And so in cases like that, there are really fascinating examples, particularly in the insect world, where um, the insects are able to use a very poor diet, okay, like plant sap. Uh, you must have seen aphids, you must have seen mealybugs uh, on your plants at home or in the fields, and they basically pierce the uh, the stem or the leaf or the of the plant, which does not have much nutrition, and they suck the juice out, and that's what they feed. And so scientists are wondering, well, how how do they manage to survive on that? And the answer is they've managed to harness symbionts, uh, which are bacteria in this in their case, which they have basically domesticated, right? And they've taken these bacteria inside their own cells, which you see on the left here. So this entire thing is one cell of this mealybug, the citrus mealybug, which grows on lime plants and lemon plants and so on. And in blue, you see the core of the, of the host cell, which is in blue, which is the nucleus, which has all the DNA. And the red is one kind of bacterium, which these cells have engulfed and it's basically their pet. And this bacterium has engulfed another bacterium, which you see here in green, which is that bacterium's pet. And basically what is really fascinating in this system is that these bacteria together produce different sets of enzymes, which will end up producing different vitamins and other things that the insect requires. And so there's this really interesting chain of events that has to occur between um, between the two different bacteria and the host cell uh, producing different parts of a whole chain of reactions, chemical reactions that have to take place in the cells to produce all the food that the, that the bug really requires. So this is fascinating. And in this case here, similarly, you see these cicadas. You must have heard them uh, uh, sort of calling in the summer on, on, uh, on trees. And, um, and these cicadas are also obligately dependent on these bacteria. And they're, they're so, so dependent that they've evolved these special organs where if you take a female cicada and you dissect her, you'll see that you know about half of the mass in the abdomen, or maybe one third in some cases, is full of these different weird structures. They look like grapes. They're called bacteriums. And these house only bacteria largely. And these bacteria are again tamed bacteria, which the cell uh, has, an, um, has engulfed in some cases. Um, and they're housed in these spe special structures. And the female cicada passes on some of these bacteria to the uh, to their babies. And these bacteria, again, like in this case, uh, produce critical important components of nutrition that the insect requires. And if you feed the insect antibiotics and that get rid of the bacteria, it dies, it can't survive. And the bacteria similarly can no longer grow without the insect. So if you just take the bacteria out and you try to grow them in a petri dish, um, they typically don't grow, right? So it's a really, really fascinating um, situation where uh, they want to eat this food, but they don't have the ability to eat it. So they you know, get in somebody help, somebody to help them with it and then they evolve together over a long time. So I think that's the end of my slides. So we'll take any more questions if there are any. No, no new, oh, just one, just, just now. Uh, we've just had one question. So from again, from Shweta Hegde. So she says, so most organisms, including insects, have some sort of symbiotic relationship with microbes, which is really essential for their survival. Um, so yeah, how is the microbiome affected when speciation occurs? Mm, good question. We don't actually know the answer to this very well. So people have not uh, looked at the process of speciation or very close to speciation to be able to answer it. What we do know is if we look at different species uh, that are reasonably closely related, in some cases, they tend to have similar microbiomes, which is the community of microbes that are uh, harbored inside their bodies. Um, but in some cases, they're not. So for example, in some cases, closely related insects have uh, <coughs> sorry, diversified to use very different uh, <coughs> sorry, very different uh, sources of food. 
in which case um, the the symbionts are probably required to provide them different benefits and deal with different toxins or something like that and in those cases we we may but well, that's maybe the reason why we find very different sets of bacterial communities in closely related species in some cases so we don't really know uh, we don't have a very good answer to this question directly okay and then we have bell harini is asking something again so it's what do animals eat if they don't get their normal food do they adjust very well and well um so yeah so sometimes they can adjust sometimes they will eat something else sometimes they will try and conserve their energy and and um, you know not spend so much energy until the conditions are better and what they need to eat uh, is to be found again in some cases you know if they don't don't find food they will die um and and so that also happens so yeah there are many different possibilities Okay, I think uh, we're uh, done with the questions. So the fun thing is uh, uh, with at least yeah, with at least uh, three of our previous uh, things, we've at some point ended up talking about uh, host bacteria and bacteria bacteria interaction. So again, we uh, ended this on the uh, uh, same note. That looks at some point we'll probably have to have one session just focused on that. I believe. We've, Yeah, it's enough to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't escape them. No. Right. Hey, this add, was fun. This yeah. Sorry. Harini's question, like, uh, actually, it is quite relevant uh, in terms of uh, uh, the global, like, uh, human activities affecting the sea, sea life, and uh, extensive, extensive fishing of small fishes, uh, which are quite leading uh, an impact, like a severe impact on population of. bigger and uh, like uh, making bigger fishes to at extinction mm -hmm. uh, level so yeah so sometimes this this kind of food um, food organism interaction or or like animal animal interaction it's mm -hmm. quite thin balance which uh, is like maintaining the uh, uh, maintaining the living bio biosystem so with this uh, um, we thank uh, deepa uh, thank you deepa um, for coming here and uh, giving our audience and us also a great insight into this this field and uh, with this um, uh, we thank our audience to join us uh, in this session and feel free to share these videos among your colleagues here and uh, feel free to give your suggestions and maybe you can give us suggestions on topic that you think are relevant and we should consider uh, uh, taking it in our next sessions so and uh, with this i would like to end uh, um, this session by saying that please like share and subscribe our social media channels <laughs> and uh, yeah uh, get involved in our science outreach program thank you and and um, goodbye thank you bye